Welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for coming out tonight on a really dreary day. Um, anyway, my name is Stephen Duncombe, and I am the co-director for the Center for Artistic Activism. Um, we often say, and it's become almost a cliche, that art moves us. Um, but I want us to take that very seriously, this idea that art moves us. Um, as an activist, one of my things, one of the the objectives I have is to actually move people off of the sidewalk and into the street for a protest. And people do that because they're passionate about something, because they feel something, because they're moved to do it. And art is one of those things that moves us to get involved. It moves us to make change. It moves us to try to transform the world. The Center for Artistic Activism is a research and training institute and sort of our tagline is, was we work with activists to get them to create a little bit more like artists, and we work with artists to get them to strategize a little bit more like activists. We've worked with about a thousand artists and activists around the world now in, I think, 14 different countries and four different continents. And in fact, my partner is right now down in Johannesburg working with the Sex Workers Union and South African artists who are working around the issues of sex work, making sex work legal, and making sex work safe. But we worked on everything from Scottish independence, which we were just talking about, to working with um, uh, youth un undocumented youth immigration activists in South Texas, to Iraq war veterans in Chicago, to LGBTQ activists in Macedonia. And again, what we're interested in all of these cases is creating art which actually moves people to get involved, which moves people to actually want to transform the world. And so what we brought here is we brought these amazing panelists um, who all in their own distinct and different ways have used their art to move people. And so what I'm gonna do right now is we're, it's gonna be very informal. I have a series of questions. And what I'm gonna do is have each of the panelists introduce themselves. And I want you to answer this question once you've introduced yourself, which is, how did you take your broken heart and make art? Or how did you take your broken heart and support others who make art as well? Um, does that make sense as a question? OK, great. Uh, Lisa, we'll start with you. Is that OK? Uh, sure. My on? I'll get on in a second. Um, my name is Lisa Dent, and I am the director of resources and award programs at uh, Creative Capital Foundation. Creative Capital was uh, developed in 1999, just after the NEA first decided not to fund individual artists. And uh, at the same time was interested in experimenting with how best to support artists beyond just financial support. So as part of our program, when you receive the award, you can um, request up to $50,000 for your artistic project. And then we also provide advisory services. So that includes things like financial planning, um, tax planning, um, legal assistance, uh, community engagement, consultations, web strategy, like. Um, and after that, the, the main awards program was put together, we um, started the professional development program, which is extended to artists who haven't received the award, a variety of workshops and webinars, um, which is how I came to know Stephen. He recently did a workshop on artist activism for um, through our PDP program. Uh, I have a background, um, a varied background. I've worked as a writer, a curator, and a scenic designer and production designer. Uh, so I... Uh, in sense, I don't consider myself an artist right now, and um, but I will say that um, you know I've I come from a family of activists. My father was a doctor in the prison system, and um, my sister and her partner are uh, prison activists. Uh, it's a part of a lot of the work they do, and I also volunteer with the Sexual Assault and Violence Intervention Program here in New York. Uh, so when I was um, interested in finding a position outside of the museum gallery structure and performance. I wanted to work at a foundation that really thought about supporting artists, but understood, um, I, th I would say, uh, an activist bent that would 
you know, connect with my background. And so it really, I would say, in terms of the broken heart part, was about, um, you know, my background with sexual assault and that work. And then becoming an artist and working and knowing a lot of artists with um, various mental and physical disabilities that were trying to incorporate that into their projects. And so now through Creative Capital, I feel like I do a lot of that. Um, it's about supporting not just the artistic project, but the whole artist and helping them not just get this one project through, but to thrive as an artist through the rest of their life. Thank you. Charlie? Uh, my name is Charlotte Wells. Um, I am a filmmaker from uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, which we were just talking about. Um, I've been in New York for about the past five years. Uh, I came from kind of like a business, um, technical side of the film industry background. Uh, and I've been in film school at NYU for the past uh, three, four years. Um, I started off in the dual degree program that they have there. It's an MBA, MFA. And then I made a film uh, and I defected. Um, from producing uh, to directing, which is kind of where my focus is uh, at the moment, writing and directing. Um, last year, I made a film um, called Laps. It's a six-minute uh, short film, relatively short short film, um, about a sexual assault that takes place in plain sight on the New York City subway. Um, it played at Sundance and South By, and is kind of on the circuit at the moment. Um, the film uh, was inspired by something not so dissimilar that happened to me on the subway in New York. And I think I always thought of myself as a person who would speak out um, in a kind of compromising situation um, of that nature, and I didn't. And uh, I think one of the most disturbing parts of the whole situation um, for me was uh, kind of realizing the tremendous capacity for self-doubt and denial that I had in a situation that really left uh, no room for um, misunderstanding with hindsight. Uh, and so that was something that I kind of felt an immediate need to explore in film. Um, the film kind of took many forms in the writing stage. It almost kind of mirrored like the stages of acceptance. <laughs> um, and what it ended up as is a, a very quiet film. It's almost completely dialogue free, um, quite experiential, um, that kind of looks at the gradual escalation of that type of assault, the public nature of it. Um, and in the case of the film, the characters uh, kind of acceptance of sorts of it at the end. Um, so that's me, that's my film. Thank you. Stefan? Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Stefan Bristol. I am from the Republic of Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Cross that body of water. <laughs> and um, I am a filmmaker. Um, I, was, uh, I just graduated from NYU Graduate Film School. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um, a little bit about my background. Um, my parents are from Guyana. I'm sure I share that heritage. But I'm a Yankee, so I was born here. And um, I always grew up loving movies and, and, and you know, going to movies. Like, I, I always loved superheroes and, and I always want to be, like, a superhero growing up. And some, of my famous, my, some of my favorite films would be, like, Jurassic Park and Back to the Future. And it's not until I, you know, wanted to really do this art when I saw um, Do the Right Thing from, from Spike Lee when I was 18 years old. And my mom was, and I told my mom, I said, look, I want to, this is what I want to study. Uh, and when I want, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And she was like, nah, I'm not paying you to go to school <laughs> to, to, to do that. And the funny thing is, now she's like my biggest fan, so that's funny. <laughs> um, recently, I made a film uh, called See You Yesterday. And um, it's about these Brooklyn teenage science prodigies who build a time machine and go back in time to save one's brother uh, from being killed by a police officer. Um, and it was a very enduring experience uh, for me to make the film because it deals with a, a, a topic that's so relevant today. Um, and and um, to answer your question about um, how I, you know, take my broken heart and make it to art, um, like I said, I love superhero movies. I, you know, I just saw um, Guardians of the Galaxy at the theater. Um, I love the Avengers. But the one thing I, I, I always leave the theaters, I always kind of like 
not feel anything from it besides just entertainment, which is fine. You know, people don't go to movies, you know, to learn anything or, or, or to get messages, you know. There's always a way to, like, hide, you know, kind of slide it in. Um, but that's my mission is, like, to make, you know, fantastic movies and, and to get audience attention, but, you know, but in a way to kind of, like, slide that message in, like, you know, uh, police should be held accountable or, like, you know, um, we need, you know, more laws towards the guns. Um, you, know, you know, we need to really figure out drug reform, you know, stuff like that. And, um, and with this film I just made, so yesterday, it's, you know, right now it's in the circuit. Um, we are a finalist at the HBO uh, short film competition in American Black Film Festival. Um, that's pretty cool. And, uh, and um, you know, one of my main uh, missions in life is to um, entertain you, but still uh, try to, you know, cut you that knowledge real quick. So that's me. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you, uh, I'm Jason Odell Williams, and I love everything you just said. Um, I'm a playwright, and uh, how I took my broken heart and turned it into art is um, with a play that's currently running like four blocks from here. Um, it's called Church and State. It's at New World Stages. Um, so if you get a chance, you've got till June 4th to go see it. Um, but it was a direct response to the shooting at, um, in Sandy Hook in Newtown. Um, it had been an idea that had been sort of cooking around in my head for a long time, sort of since Virginia Tech and then the shooting in Tucson. And then I think like a lot of us after, after Newtown, we were just angry. Um, and if uh, a first grade, first grade classroom um, getting shot by someone with an automatic weapon doesn't make our politicians do something, then what will, right? It's very seemed very justifiable to ignore all of the other ones, you know, the sort of the daily shootings in Chicago and Baltimore, where I'm from, and, and, and yet this just seems so obvious. And, and yet, of course, nothing happened. So I was angry, and I, I turned it into a play. And, um, but uh, as you were saying, y you can't just scream at people and give them, you know, do the right thing, as like the movie. You need to entertain them first and then have the message. Um, and so it took about two and a half years to try and make what was originally just a 30-page um, Facebook rant uh, in, into, hopefully, art. Um, and so there's a lot of humor um, and then um, some heartbreak, more humor, um, a surprise twist, and then hopefully something that's uplifting at the end. Um, but I, I think that's always been my goal as an artist. I started as an actor uh, and then moved towards writing because I wasn't seeing the kind of things that you're talking about. Either, either there was the, the, the plays that were just sheer entertainment or the plays that were really a lecture. And, and I'm, I'm not interested in that. I wanted to see something that was a little bit of both. So um, that's sort of my little spiel. Yeah. Great, thank you. And actually, Jason, I want to kind of work off something you just said, but open the question up to everybody here, which is how do you take this passion, this heartbreak, um, and actually craft it into art? How do you make it into a story? How do you make it, as Stefan said, entertaining? Um, how do you take a trauma like sexual abuse and actually tell a story about it? Um, because nobody does want to hear someone ranting on a soapbox. No. Uh, maybe your friends did on Facebook, but probably not even them. No, no. Um, and, and I think that we are, we're storytelling and story listening people. And one of the things that artists can do is they can tell stories. But there's a, there's a movement that has to happen from, I am so angry right now, to how do I communicate that in such a way that people will listen? Um, do you want to jump in with that and then we'll yeah, just I go mean, back I, down the line? I, 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 think, I think just the fact that we're all artists means that we take that heartbreak and turn it into art. I think other people would do it differently. They would just be angry and, you know, complain to their spouse at dinner or, or on Facebook. But I think we feel this passion, this desire, this need to turn it into art. And so, I, like, I just, I didn't know what else to do. Um, and so I, I just, I, I wrote this 30-page thing that was 
nothing. Um, and then I figured out, oh, who would these characters be? And then you slow, and then you start to shape it. And then that's where the artist work comes in. So you're, it starts with your passion, and then you go in with your artist's hat, and you shape it, shape it, shape it. And then what you have to try and do, I think, at some point is, why did I start writing this? Because you can get lost in the weeds, and it can go off the rails, or just become entertaining, and you forgot sort of what's the thesis of the whole thing. And you kind of have to switch hats. Um, and a play goes through lots of iterations, through when, you know, once you start rehearsing and stuff like that. And as a film, I'm sure, does, as you're shooting, things change on the day. And as you're editing, it's get, essentially getting rewritten. Um, but just to try and always remember what was the initial spark. Um, and, and then just tell the story that you want to see is, is, is the short answer. It's not easy, but tell the story you want to see and hear. So, um you have this, I love this idea of trying to almost make a superhero film, an act, you know, a film that, that people want to see. Not that people don't want to see all sorts of avant-garde theater. I'm not saying that, okay? Um, but popular culture. And how do you do that sort of transitional work from police violence, a very heavy, heavy issue, to popular culture, which, as you said before, is often about making people forget their trauma, forget their problems. Um, when I started working on the film, I was writing um, the, sh um, the feature of, of it about a boy who's trying to go back in time and stop his father from um, being a drunk driver and hitting his best friend. Um, and that was the summer of 2014. And I think we all know what happened during that summer. And it was uh, Mike Brown getting shot. Um, excuse me, Mike Brown getting murdered on the street, and then Eric Garner getting uh, murdered also by being choked out by the police officer on, on Staten Island. Um, so that bled into my script. Um, and when I show that, show my script to uh, my professors at NYU, she said, you know, you have this moment of police brutality in it. You cannot ignore that. Um, so you have to either take it out or, or go with it 110 percent. And, uh, it, you know, and I took a deep breath for like a long week <laughs> because I knew I'm going to go tread the waters of something very, um, very significant. Um, and I, I, was, I was completely angry with what is ha what's happening in our country because it's not the first time, you know, I, I would keep hearing my, about this. You know, I grew up in New York. We all know about Amadou Diallo. We all know about Sean Bell. Um, so it's just like it kept overlapping. And I said, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I, you know, I was thinking in my head, the biggest lesson I learned from NYU is, is the writing, obviously, but how you, um, people respond to the film. Characters, people have to fall in love with the characters. That's how you get your message across. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a, a slow burn in, independent film or a fast paced action adventure film. The main thing is, is people to fall in love with the characters. Um, so I work the characters to the T. I cast, um, you know, in the script are teenagers, so I cast teens and, and I do a workshop and, and I work the script. Um, and, and I also knew during that time um, that this was going to be a main topic today in a lot of uh, uh, films and, and theater, um, like Shots Fired and... Um, um, you know, the documentaries of um, the, non, um, the L.A. riots, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a pretty good documentary. And I said, I got to say it in a different way, and, and, and why not science fiction? So, so it's, you have to, like, sculpt it until, it, until the blend becomes, you know, un unique in its own way. Yeah. I mean, science fiction is really interesting because science fiction, of course, has always been used to imagine either utopias or dystopias. And so it has sort of an inherent political capacity because you're imagining what could be or imagining what will be. Um, Charlotte, you, I mean, this is an experience you had. So it must have been incredibly, I mean, painful, maybe cathartic, but how did you work from that personal experience into something that actually might resonate with people outside of that experience? Um, well, I think, well, a combination of two things that uh, you both said earlier. One, like, I think it was, like, I felt this immediate need afterward, um, just what you were saying. Like, it just, like, very quickly I started to formulate 
like ideas of like ways to express this. And I wasn't really sure why my my head went there, and I second guessed it, and then I kind of accepted, okay, this is how I'm going to work through whatever I feel about this. And it did start off with a lot of anger. I think the, I think the very first idea I had was a very experimental, violent <laughs> piece. Um, and then you know I sat down and I I spent time writing. And I actually started off, once I had pen to paper, is, is like a much longer piece. It was very talky. There were more characters. Um, and I kind of drilled down on what do I want this to be? Like, what is the single kind of moment that I'm trying to capture or feeling that I'm trying to capture? And I think, you know, it, during that stage of the process, feedback, especially when it is something that is so personal, um, and singular to kind of an experience feedback was very helpful in finding maybe something a little bit more universal and also narrative, like making sure that the story was clear and coherent. Um, I think because it was a short film, I didn't have to worry too much about it being very heavy. <laughs> Somebody said to me recently, drama is not a dirty word. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been trying to embrace that. Um, and I certainly did in this film because there, there really isn't much room for levity. Um, but also, like I think there's something to be said for making something very specific and finding the universal that way. You know, like my film takes place over a very short moment, really. Um, it doesn't go too far beyond that. And I think uh, the reactions that I've had um, have spoken to that. To having made it like as specific in some ways to my experience, and others like I did, I did research as, as I was working on this, and um, yeah, like read of other people's experiences, incorporated details. But I think as specific as possible served me and my process and the film overall um, very well. Right. So, Lisa, you actually help artists to move from whatever they're passionate about whatever moves them to an art form which might move other people. What, what advice do you give to artists who are trying to do this sort of work? Well, the, the first, when the artists come in, you know, they're at a variety of stages in their lives and careers and projects. Um, so there is sort of this uh, orientation meeting and then an inter intake conversation, I guess you would call it where I'm asking them what they want for themselves. And it's a process of me being able to learn um, what they need. And so, you know, sometimes describing my job is difficult because people assume it's, you know, we just do the same things every day. And even though I might be able to rail off a suite of these particular advisory services, each project needs different things and each one each person would like to connect with a different community in the country or the world, really. I mean, you just need to be a US citizen or have a green card to apply to our program, but you can work anywhere. Um, so I think of myself as a connector. Uh, and it turned out that my background in these different disciplines was very useful because I have colleagues or I'm connected in such a way that I can reach out and find what they might need within their discipline. But also, um, I've also lived in several places across the country and you know, could do a deep dive in Ohio or California or Washington DC or New York and, and then find them what they need. And, the Creative Capital staff is very similar in that way. I, you know, I actually applied for that job when I was living in Ohio and thought, you know, it's very difficult to get a position in New York when you're living outside. But in actuality, most of our staff have lived somewhere else because it allows us to have an office full of people who can say, oh, well, I'm in from Nashville, you should call this person, or I've been in Seattle, you know, and I hear. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, so one of the things that we do in, in our trainings is the, the last day of about a four or five day session, we brainstorm, hone, 
build the props for and execute some sort of an artistic action all in 24 hours and then reflect upon it, which of course is impossible to do. Um, but that's part of, the, part of the process as well. Um, and it's great fun. One of the questions we always ask when we're trying to narrow down from about 40 different ideas to one or two, and then we get to the one or two, is we ask the people we're working, for, working with, what do you want your audience to think? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to do? Because that is so important in thinking about how do we move people from sort of the sidewalk into some sort of activity. Um, Stefan, you said, um, you're really interested in how people are going to respond to the film. So I want to start with you about, with your films, what do you want people to think, feel, and do? That, that choice is up to the audience, honestly. But when you walk away, I hope that when you walk away from the film, you have experienced what the characters experience on screen. Um, I hope that you walk away um, knowing that what the characters went through. Okay, so let me backtrack. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this film I'm working on right now, the, char the characters experience a loss of life through the hands of the people that are sworn to protect you. The officers goes up to the kids Ask them where's your ID. They ask them, you know, um, why are we being stopped? I just need to see your ID. And they and one of the kids already know about the the robbery that happens at the store. So the kids already, the officers already approach the kids in a very wrong way, but not allowing them. This is what's happening. This is what I need you to do. Everything is gonna be cool. We have I've, I've experienced that, experienced that myself. My friends have experienced that. Thank God, you know, the people who have experienced that I know with, with guns in their faces are still alive. I'm just afraid of losing somebody that I love. And it's not, when, when the people who are trying to protect you take away that life, you're not only taking away just one life, you take away multiple lives. You're taking away an opportunity for that, for that family to grow with that individual who is gone. Um, I, want, I want them to, uh, there is a call to action. I want the audience themselves to feel um, when they leave the theater, like, okay, I have to do something. If this happened to me, what can I do about it before it happens to someone else? Um, and also to keep the conversation going ab about it, about police brutality and or whatever topic I want to happen. Because one, I think, one thing I notice is, um, uh, about police brutality in particular, people don't want to talk about it anymore. It's just like, it's just a topic that's too much. I go on Facebook or Twitter and to see this always happening, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Well, we have to keep talking about it until it's, until it gets better. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be police brutality, it could be, you know, war on drugs, whatever it is. Um, if you want something to disappear, we got to keep talking about it. So that's what I want. Cool. Um, sorry to get all NYU professor on you. Um, but this idea about you wanting them to continue a conversation. Yeah. I mean, uh, go back to Aristotle. And he basically argues in some ways that what theater can do is purge those emotions, have a form of catharsis. So you don't need to have that conversation mm -hmm. because the people on the screen just had it for you. Right? And this is something people like Augusto Boal, Bertolt Brecht, we're really trying to solve in theater, right? And trying to figure out how do we get the conversation to happen outside the theater, not just on the screen. How do you approach that in your work so that the conversation happens so people don't feel like, well, you know, I saw a film, I understand, I feel better about myself now for understanding. Oh, I, I don't have a happy ending in my film. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's one of the things you do, right? Right, that's one of the things I do, yeah. I, um, as a writer, I don't want there to be a happy-go-lucky ending. I just want it to be a, an appropriate ending um, based on what the audience needs to take away from. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to give away the ending of mine, but still. No, we, we won't do that. Okay, <laughs> but still, it's, you know, it's, a, it's all about the ending and, and the intent. 
Right. So you don't allow an easy resolution. Never. In the end. Okay. Okay. Because it's, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 please, please. Um, the, also, the hardest thing for me as a filmmaker is learning both sides of the fence. Um, I've tried to interview police officers too, which is mm -hmm. pretty damn hard. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I also try to figure out how, how also they feel about the situation. Um, so that, it, so that you know, we're not just leaving the um, the audience won't just leave with just one heavy-handed side of the um, of the idea of what, what the movie's supposed to be. Good. Charlotte, how about you? What do you want your audience to think, feel, and do? Um, I mean, I think reactions to this film have actually been very interesting. Just to kind of go go from what I've observed. Um, like I, I've seen it play in, in front of quite a few people now. And I think there's a split in audiences that I've found to be interesting. Um, there are people who have experienced something very similar in the film resonates like on a um, fairly visceral level. Um, and then there are others who don't see anything um, as having happened in the film mm. at all. Um, I've observed more of those people to be men. Uh, and it's interesting being in a QA and and somebody saying, what happened? Mm. And, uh, you know, for people who have experienced something similar, it's, that's, it's not a question. Um, and then I, I've spoken to others who have said, I had no idea this kind of thing happened. Also typically um, men who, you know, just aren't as aware of this experience of it being, of being in this case, um, a female um, on the subway. And not, not that it only happens to women, but certainly in the case of the film it is, and the way that it happens I think is usually specific to women. Um, so that's what I've observed people reacting to. Um, I did try to make, which I kind of spoke to already, like a film that was very specific in its experience. You can't kind of have every side of a conversation in a film. I think you have to choose one and hope that the conversation is built around that, you know, for, for better or worse. And I chose, I'm also not really an um, executor of upbeat endings. Um, and in the case of, of my film, the character comes off the train, kind of takes a moment and gets back on. Um, and it was really about a kind of moment of, you know, I said that I was trying to build toward this, this kind of one moment in the film. And the moment in my film is, this just happened. I'm accepting that this just happened, but my day you know, is going on, I need to get to work, I need to get back on the train um, in multiple senses. Uh, and I think that's not me saying that that is how one should react um, at all, but it is the way that my character reacts. And, you know, as Stefan said, like, my hope is that it facilitates conversation. Um, a conversation because I think I, it's an experience that people don't talk about. And I think once it happened to me and I did talk about it, mm -hmm. it was fairly horrifying to me how many people had a similar experience. And it's not something that we had shared before. Um, yeah, and so I think like, for me that was, conversation was a, a big part of it. Thank you. Jason? Uh, yeah, just to echo what you guys both said. At, at I, I hope to facilitate a conversation. One of the things that we're doing with our play um, is we've been having talkbacks um, every Wednesday, either with just me and the cast, or that we've been partnering with um, organizations who are um, on various sort of missions around the gun violence issue. So we partnered with Every Town for Gun Safety, the president of Every Town for Gun Safety, and actress Julianne Moore were there with us. Um, we partnered with Sandy Hook Promise. We had Senator Chris Murphy and um, Mark Barden, who founded Sandy Hook Promise and lost his son Daniel at, at Newtown. Um, we had people from Virginia Tech, uh, New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. Um, and, and what it does, it, after the play, um, I mean, uh, like everything you were saying, the Aristotle, uh, the, the play hopefully is very cathartic. Um, but it's also, hopefully we're coming at it from both sides. I mean, 
basically, I, I didn't really go into the details, but what the play is about is, is there's a school shooting and a Republican senator, a Christian Republican senator, um, has a crisis of faith about God and then questions his stance on guns at the same time. And his Christian wife and his liberal Jewish campaign manager are trying to sort of, uh, you know, pull him back so he doesn't go off script. He's about to get to give a speech three days before um, he's up for re-election. Uh, so it's about this sort of conversation backstage before a essentially a campaign stump speech. Um, and hopefully we are seeing all sides of the issue about God, about guns, about um, uh, just sort of being a, a politician, being a husband, a father, being a good man, a good person. So I, I think people after the play want to talk about the gun issue. They want to talk about the, the, the faith issue. Um, and so we provided a platform, like literally, you know, people can talk about it afterwards. So that has been really satisfying and gratifying to me to allow that to actually happen. Um, and I think that's kind of like what you want from any piece of art. Like I saw Guardians of the Galaxy, I loved it. But I mean, we talked about all the cool moments in it afterwards for a long time, but you didn't talk about like what was the big social relevance of them, re relevance of that movie. Um, and it didn't, you know, stick with you forever and ever. Um, and I, I, I do like that movie. I like those movies. But, you know, you want a play or a piece of art, a film to stick with you for a while and stick in their craw and make them think about it. Um, so hopefully people are moved emotionally. Maybe they're... Um, they feel uncomfortable in some moments during the play. Um, uh, hopefully you move them to laughter and then tears, and so they have that cathartic moment, and then they're open to have a conversation. What's also been really great is we've had people, obviously we're in New York and we're a very blue state, but we've had people who voted for Trump and who are NRA members, and they come to the play and they enjoy it and they participate mm -hmm. in the conversation. So that's the ultimate goal is to get the play to red states and then see if you can change some hearts and minds down there. Um, because it is very easy to talk in our own bubble. Um, but yeah, the, the goal would be to, to, to show a film to people who are like, I didn't know that happened. Mm -hmm. And you're just, hopefully you're waking people up and people saying like, wow, you went through that. Uh, I didn't know that that happens all the time. So that's, I think that's the goal with lots of art and it sounds like at least our three pieces. Yeah, great. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, you want to say something? Yeah, just I'm always fascinated by um, the audience question. So uh, in our experience at Creative Capital, um, when it comes to really asking the artists about audience, um, it very much mirrors the way that the artists here have talked. Um, so the performing artists or the theater people are very sort of versed in like, we do a talk back, we see people, we, you know, there's something about this person to person, the analog engagement that theater people just get. And then um, filmmakers completely understand there's an audience, yet they are, you know, wanting, or at least for a while, it seems like at the beginning of their engagement with us are ready, willing to let the audience figure it out and just leave it alone. And, and then novelists and poets and visual artists are just lost. And, like, and um, so what's been interesting for us is to um, work on the marketing and PR with the artists on their projects. And part of that is that our founding director, Ruby Lerner, had very much had a marketing background. But um, I become fascinated. The reason I use the word fascinated is because, you know, I sing, I make things sometimes, but I don't need anyone to see it. But these are people who have all chosen to do this um, in such a way that they want people to see what they're doing, and yet they don't really want to engage. It's this really interesting push and pull that I think artists have. And to get them to really deeply think about who do you want to see this? When do you want them to see it? And in what way and why? Um, is one, the artists that have really taken that on have transformed their projects, I can just tell you. I mean, um, you know, professional accolades, uh, more funding, uh, you know, just incredible stuff. And I just think it's something that needs to be addressed in school, I don't think other than theater, it's 
just at all. I think um, in professional development afterwards, um, it, it, you know, the websites kind of started to help some people think about it because finally like, okay, I have to have a website. But they don't really, they're not really engaging project to project and thinking about, am I expanding my audience? Is this the same audience? Do I want to go, you know, and it's, it's big and, I mean, I could get historical with it, but when I mentioned that the NEA stopped funding individual artists and all of this thing, you know, not everyone understands that what they really did was, you know, have individuals lose their agency over their projects, right? So we're going to give the money to um, corporations and nonprofits, and they're going to listen to their audiences and decide what's going to do. And so one thing that we're trying to do with our grant is to give the artists back their agency so that they can say what they want to say and talk to who they want to talk to without as many mediators, and then become a good partner to whatever institution that they do decide to work with so that they understand the conversation around marketing and PR and audience so that they don't just take it for granted that the venue or the publisher is going to do it. They have a say and they talk about what they want. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. One of the things I love about Creative Capital is that you actually take artists very seriously. And you take them very seriously as people that have to make a living in the world, but you also take them very seriously as people who has have agency. And and I remember the first workshop that we came in and did for you all. Um, one of the things we talked about was thinking about artwork in terms of a campaign. Um, so my background is I was a professional activist um, since about 17 or 18. I come from a family of professional activists. My dad worked on Selma. Um, and so I just think this way. Um, and my partner is a conceptual artist, and he was trained never to think about an audience, to have almost contempt for an audience. It is what I think. And you know, you can imagine all the sort of the, the, the dreams he had of himself up in a garret. Yeah. Nobody understands me. I eat cold rice and beans. <laughs> that means I am a genius, right? And he came to an awakening of, if I want to transform the world, I have to have, I have to think about the audience. I have to have people listen to me. I have to have people do something with the art that I put out there in the world. So one of the things that an activist does, um, and this is what we do with artists, is we never think in terms of solely, in terms of tactics. And I'm gonna transform what a tactic is. is a tactic is a thing that you do in order to bring about an objective. So for example, a tactic might be getting people to sign petitions in order to pressure a politician to pass a certain law. Or a tactic might be to have a big demonstration down in Washington DC to show the people that uh, these people disagree with the Trump administration and they're standing up for women's rights or whatever. These are all just tactics though. Um, tactics are only good insofar as they're a means to an end. And the means to the end is an objective. And the objective can be getting a politician to do X, Y, and Z. And the objective can be to create a feeling of mass support on the street so you can get up and go out the next day feeling like you're not alone and isolated. Um, but these objectives are very concrete. And then each objective leads to another objective which then leads to an ultimate goal. And you never get to the goal. It's like utopia. It's on the horizon. It keeps going away, right? But you need these sort of milestones in order to know that you're moving forward. So one of the things I heard from the artist on stage is this idea of creating a conversation um, and raising awareness. So I'm going to push back on this a little bit. Coming from an activist, that's easy. Okay. That is the low-hanging fruit of transformation. That is, is I can create awareness by going out there and painting something big, red, and shiny and screaming a lot, okay? I can create a conversation by, this is a little bit harder, right? Because now you have to create a scenario for a conversation. You have to give them characters that they can identify with and not just, here's one point of view, a multiplicity of point of view. It's much harder, but you have all, that's, that's your objective. My question to you is, what's next? Now that people are having a conversation about gun violence, people are having a conversation about police violence, people are having a conversation about sexual assault, what can you do 
to move them to the next step? And what might that next step be? Well, I, I think what you have to do is you have to start in a small pond and then just hope that it, you can you know, get to the lake and then the ocean. So you start, we started in a small theater in LA. We went to a small theater in Rochester, New York. We're at a smallish theater here in New York City. And then it's like, all right, well, now we want to get our goal. Our goal, and we know what our goal is, is to get to all 50 states. I would, I would love to have that. And, and then the more people you reach, then you can maybe hopefully reach a critical mass. I mean, I think with the gun violence issue specifically, I think it will happen. Chris Murphy even said it. In about 20, 25 years, th there will just be a sea change. Um, uh, you, you, you see it sort of evolving with civil rights, gay rights, I think this might be maybe the next one that's gonna tip. And there's always a pushback afterwards, right? It's never a, a two steps forward and that's it. But so I think as, if we just keep making noise and hopefully, I know this play isn't the thing that's gonna do it, but it's a, it's a small pebble in, in, a, in a lake that I, if everybody's throwing small pebbles in, then suddenly it's a, it's a wave crashing down on the White House. And Congress is really, forget the White House, it's Congress. Um, the White House is a dead end right now. Um, so so that, that's the goal is just to have lots of conversations and lots of theaters this size all over the country and suddenly millions of people are talking about it and then suddenly millions of people are voting um, the, the, the people out who are no longer on the right side of this issue, at least for, for the, 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 the issue that my play is about, which is gun violence. Thank you. Dylan? Um, the one, the biggest, the reason why we're here is because we, we want to be influences, influencers in media. We want to set trends and everything. And one thing I know about media, um, everybody has an agenda. And sometimes our agenda has been pushed too much to create negative images of certain people. Um, you know, for me in particular, you know, I'm still pretty pissed off um, about how the media often portrays black people. Not just black people, Asian people, Latino people, what have you. I can't control all that, um, but my end goal is to, you know, show that there are, is diversity within these groups. Um, there is diversity within black people. There is diversity within a Latino, or Latinx, um, if you will. Um, so my objective um, is to co is to continue to influence to push positive images of young black people, um, which is the one, one of the reasons why I tackle police brutality at this time. Because um, I saw a video of an officer explaining to one of the women that he arrested, and she was a very brilliant woman too. She said, why are you always doing this to us? And the officer says, you want to know why? Because throughout my life and throughout the department, we often believe that black people have violent tendencies. And when I heard that, and it made sense to me, is because of how often media push the negative images of uh, people of color. And, I, and, I, and um, once I go to you know, school, when I, in school growing up, and, 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 and um, even sometimes in NYU, unfortunately, um, people often think that I know, you know hip hop so much, or I know, <laughs> and I, don't, I, I, I love jazz more than hip hop. That's just me. Um, I list, I'll list, listen to Miles Davis way more than I'll listen to Wayne, uh, Lil Wayne. That's just me. Um, so for me, it's like my, my objective right now is not to create um, characters, main central characters or stories um, of drug dealers, or pimps, or prostitutes. I want to create more stories of brilliant scientists. Thank God for hidden figures. I want to create um, more positive um, politicians. Um, you know, and um, so if the more I will do that through all, throughout all my all my work, I hope to push more, um, up, influence other pe other artists to do the same thing and, and realize that black people we are completely diverse. For me, Laps was um, a personal project in the ways that I've described, but it was also a challenge to myself to start speaking up, speaking out, and acting um, in a much more present way in the world. 
Um, so if we start with a pond, I'm kind of trying to at least make myself a drop and um, start taking responsibility in that way. And it actually took me a while to even kind of realize the degree to which the film could even be a conversation. It's so true, artists and filmmakers, and especially student short filmmakers, um, you know, like it, it can very easily be navel-gazing and self-indulgent. And I think I am, by an immeasurable degree, my harshest critic. And during um, post-production and production and even screening, you know, like I've been hard on myself at times. And there was a screening at South by Southwest where I watched the film and it played among um, like a very strong field. It played uh, with um, a film called Decalb Avenue, um, which is doing very well at the moment, um, about uh, the kind of avoidance of a school shooting. Um, and I was just blown away and I sat there thinking my film is crap. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I doing here? This is t like, uh, just filled with self-doubt. And, uh, and so many women came up to me after that screening and thanked me for making the film. And it made me lift my head a little bit and open my eyes and see that actually maybe I'd made something that extended beyond myself, um, which was really nice and validating, I suppose, as an artist. But I think, yeah, important to take that step outside of myself and outside of the film and art um, to be able to engage in all of this more directly. Um, and then in a very literal sense, like, I hope that people have their eyes open on the New York City subway mm -hmm. and that people speak out if they see something happening and not be afraid of the worst that can happen, which is, I mean, there's really no downside to speaking out. Lisa, I noticed when I was talking about low-hanging fruit, you were nodding your head. So I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. Um, the part about conceptual artists, you mean? No. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a lot to say about that. Yeah. And I was talking about the raising awareness being low-hanging fruit or conversations and that, that yeah. sort of challenging artists to say, as these three just have, what is your goal in the end? Where do you want to go um, with all of this? Yes, because uh, I guess uh, the, the question or the, the difficult part is, as you said, moving to action. I think that there are a lot of things that we can be aware of and not understand what we need to do in order to make a change. You know, I think that the most recent presidential election was really interesting for um, people in my family, my communities, because it was not a surprise nor something that made us more upset than any of the, the incidents the previous summer um, with the many black men that were killed. And that for many people was the moment of call to action and not the presidential election. So, you know, what what is it that seems, you know, the awareness of many horrible things going on in the country clearly didn't move people to not only vote, you know, the other way or vote at all, right? So I guess in my experience since the election, it's been more of a conversation about artists who are um, adding activism to their work. And I've been asking them, why are they separate? And some people choose to, you know, that's what they want. They, they really do want to make artwork. And then there's this, you know, some more activist, you know, actions that they are taking in order to create change. And um, I think that works too, but I think that there are also opportunities around uh, a film or a performance or a book or a visual arts exhibition to engage your public and actually have them do something, right? Not just potentially go home and have a conversation, but in that space, do something. And 
Uh, I just, I'm going, I think that we are going to see that more often. And I understand that it's very uncomfortable for lots of audience members. They don't want to have those conversations in public. They don't want to reveal how they feel about, you know, these different political ideas. I'm, you know, this is not my creative capital hat. I'll take that off for a second. Just say for my personally that I think that it's time. I think it's actually time. We've, we can't keep saying that we just want to have polite conversations. Um, and I'm not suggesting it's, it's violence. I'm suggesting that discomfort is not the worst thing you do. Can, if I could just say one other thing. Oh, please. It, you know, ironically, on the way to here, I um, got into something with a guy on the subway. <laughs> and um, I was, a bunch of us were waiting for the C train, and this, you know, six foot one, very straight, very white man came in last and just pushed everybody, said, move in, I need to get on. <laughs> And he happened to push this woman, an Asian American woman, and then me, and another um, African American woman, and then other one. Anyway, I, the Asian American woman spoke first, and I think because she spoke up, I felt like I need to speak up, and I'm ready to speak up. If this had been three years ago, I don't think I would have. But I, you know, he was so arrogant about the whole thing. I mean, he was just like, you, I needed to be here. I needed this space and you were all in my way that it just triggered something. And I just kept saying, so we should all move away from you, the straight, white, tall man. Like, there, like in every category, he was privileged and he was able-bodied. He was all of these things. And he was so angry. I mean, I've never, like, so angry, and that I called him white, that I called him straight, that I called, and I said, you're not white, you're, you know, you're not, you know, and, um, you know, other people were, looked fearful at me, he was clearly about to hit me, and, you know, but I don't, I just don't feel like I have a choice at this point in my life, you know, I don't, and it's new, um, but I, I just want people, there are horrible things. He could have hit me. He could have had a weapon, could have done things. I don't know. But the, the shift of the arrogance of people on one hand, and, it, you know, it's been fascinating to watch. I've encountered it. <coughs> you know, I've, unfortunately, I had to go to Washington, D.C. around the, the inauguration time, and, um, I was scared. There were people yelling at me about my afro and about my things in a way that has never happened to me. And so I just feel like um, artists are citizens and we don't have a choice. Yeah. I, I, there's nothing more I could say after that. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, yeah. 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 Um, but people do have things they want you to say. Um, so we have some questions here. Um, and I'm just there. I was looking through them. Can They're I say all great real questions. Quick? Oh yeah, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just um, I want. I just want to say something just real, real off the cuff. I think what you you make in that film is the bravest thing I've heard in a long time. That was that's very personal. I I would I would never do something like that. And I just want to commend you for making that. Yeah, really, We're all done. Really. Well, and I want to commend everybody here. This is not over. OK, because what you're all doing is actually taking what you're good at and bringing it to the fore. That is, is that I'm all for artists who then want to separate their art from their activism. But I think that artists have been trained to be artists. They might have a particular talent to be an artist. They have a way of looking at the world, which is absolutely invaluable at this moment. Uh, the first rule of guerrilla warfare is to know your terrain and use it to your advantage. Um, and that doesn't mean the jungles of Vietnam. It doesn't mean the mountains of Cuba. It means that we live in an age of spectacle. We live in an age of story, of sign, and of symbol. And that is what artists are good at. We're really good at it. And so for you to step up and say, 
I'm going to use my skills to actually do something is what this world needs right now. So thank you for that. Um, I do have some questions for you. And they're all great questions. Um, so I'm just going to take them how they came. Um, this is from Andrea. Um, and just anybody jump in and uh, respond to this. We tend to preach to the choir. How do we go about creating a project that will interest people who need to hear our message? Mm -hmm. Not the choir. <laughs> I do want to say that the choir needs to hear the message too. That is, I, I go to church, right? I keep going to church. They do the same damn thing every single week, right? <laughs> um, and they, they give you the little wafer. <laughs> they give you a little wine because they understand you got to keep coming back. You got to keep coming back, right? But there also needs to get outside the choir too. So how do you, how do you all think about that? How do you respond to that in your own work? Well, it, it, it's funny because um, preaching to the choir is something that during our talk back, somebody always says like, well, clearly you're a little bit preaching to the choir here. So I hear that word all the time. Because at the end, the, the play ends literally with a, a, a four minute speech by the senator who is basically saying what everyone would want to say. Can't we get our act together? Um, and, but I think you do have to preach to the choir because you have to remind people in this age of so much media and consuming so much stuff, you have to remind people what to give a shit about, right? Like, you need to care. Uh, and so, yeah, you go to church over and over and over again because you got to be reminded. You need to care. You need to do the daily practice. So yeah, I think preaching to the choir is not a horrible thing. But then how do you get to the other people? I, I, I think movies and theater and stand-up comedy are the ways to do it because those are the few places where people from all ethnicities, um, cultural backgrounds, economic backgrounds, political backgrounds, they all come into the same space because they want to be entertained. And then they're like, oh, wow, there was a message there. Um, I didn't know it was going to be there, but oh, maybe I'll think differently about stuff. So I, th I think, yeah, you start preaching to the choir, but hopefully you're just, your thing is entertaining or engaging enough that people are going to come because they want to see that. I mean, Amy Schumer gets people because she's funny, and then she spends five minutes in her set talking about gun violence. And people are pissed off in Texas, and they're booing her, but she's like, I'm going to give you my five minutes. You're going to take it. Um, because I'm Amy Schumer and I have the microphone. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, you start with your choir and then you just collect these other people and eventually we will outnumber them. So hopefully on the good issues. Anybody else want to speak to that? I mean, as a filmmaker, I feel lucky to be preaching to anybody, um, I think. And I feel like, in, just like wildly fortunate that my film has played where it has played. But I'm also aware that it's played probably mostly in front of filmmakers. Um, and so I, I have tried and where I've been submitting it not to be remotely precious and just try to get this out there. Because I think at some point, and this might be the only film I ever make that, that is tr this is true for, I think it could actually reach quite a lot of people. Um, and that's really exciting to me. And so at some point very soon, I'm gonna get it up online and just try to get it in front of as many people as I possibly can. Uh, you trick them. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of my tactics um, for marketing is you, you don't put the main message up front. You know, in the trailer, in, in your poster, you've, you, you let them think it's one thing, but when they go to the theater, like, ah, he got me. <laughs> Do you find that people, um, sorry, to, do, oh, uh, please. when people, uh, do they respond well to that? Are they glad that they got tricked? Or are they like, man, that wasn't what I wanted it to be? Or do you get both? As long as the trickiness is organic, they, they was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, and I think that's important. Don't like trick them and then slap in the face with it. Like, you have to, you have to ease it in. Uh, <laughs> And just to <laughs> and just to pick you off what um, Charlotte was saying, I submitted my project everywhere. I submitted to like over a hundred festivals. Granted, we didn't get into um, like twenty of them, which is fine, but we did get to you know quite nice ones. And um, 
you know, since my film is a very black theme, I was surprised we got to this festival out in the middle of um, Pennsylvania. I was like, okay, I, you know, I wish I could be there. I, would, I really want to see what they respond, what, what, how they respond to the film. Um, so it's like you have to take a chance and, and go to places where sometimes strategically, not, that not every place would receive it well, but go to places where you think your project, whatever it is, um, film, theater, or, or um, um, spoken word, and, and see how that audience was, will respond. Not, not, not everybody is going to uh, mess with your film. Not everybody is going to give you a positive response, and then that's cool. That's fine. As long as you are able to communicate, uh, given the opportunity to communicate and show your work, you know, that's part of the job. And then also the part of the job is people is, you know, excuse my French, shit on you. Lisa, this is what Creative Capital does in a lot of ways, is try to get people out there. Um, yeah, um, and through our professional development pro program, we partner with arts councils, state arts councils, city arts councils a lot. And one of our best partners is the Montana Arts Council. And, um, can't, oh yeah, oh, who said that? All right, Montana <laughs> in the house. Um, and we actually were just talking about this today at work that we are thinking about ways for the award program to reach out and really get more applicants in certain areas. We, we've never had an applicant from Mississippi. It's the only state that we've never had anyone even apply to get the award. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing that we're hearing, Buzz, I don't know if anyone else has heard, you know, heard this about the NEA and the NEH. So the NEH director just stepped down and, you know, they're figuring things out. But there really is a possibility that a very conservative person would be in those roles, which, interestingly enough, would mean that they would want more funding to go to arts organizations in these red states or to bring artists to those places. And so I think that, in a strange way, it's potentially an opportunity yeah. um, to engage in that in the way that you're talking about. Yeah, definitely, this kind of moves from out to in. Um, this next question from Tommy: um, Someone once dear to me said, "I want to touch people's hearts, get right down to their souls." Any personal artistic thoughts on how to accomplish this? Any mechanisms to focus on? How do you touch people? I, I mean, I, I, I think that's the goal. Uh, whether or not you do it is just sort of up to the gods, I guess. Um, I, I think the only way you can do it is to move yourself with your art. I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but you always have to just write or create for yourself. You have to love it. You have to you know, bleed for it. You have to, as you're going over it, I think we all essentially write. So before you start filming, you, as you're reading it over and over and over again, it still needs to move you. And if it still moves you, whether it makes you laugh or cry or whatever, then then hopefully it will do that to someone else. And and like Charlotte was saying, you're always full of self-doubt. Maybe people hate it, maybe people love it, but once in a while, someone will come up to you afterwards and say, this was the most important thing I've ever seen. This moved me. This touched me, and you're like, all right, well, that's one, that's two, there's five, there's ten. Even if it's that's it, that's something. Um, so I think you just make the best thing you can, the thing that moves you, and then just give over to fate, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, that is the goal, and it's really difficult. And I think, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm just starting out, but. In each of the projects that I've done, um, I feel like I've taken kind of risks narratively to try to do that, not knowing if they'll pay off. And sometimes they haven't. But even when they haven't, there's always been one person or two or three or one <laughs> who have come up and said, I'd like, who just understood it from start to finish. Like every intention that you had every beat that you were going for and it's incredible you know and I think that in order to achieve that it's also about kind of setting your expectations of how many people do you want to reach because I don't know I'm still figuring this out but maybe if you're trying to get to people on that level like I don't think it's possible to hit everybody at once and so I think trusting 
in exactly what you're trying to say and taking risks to get there, whatever that means for the project or for you is, well, for me so far, the only way that I've been able to get close. And Charlotte, I'm going to actually go off that from the next person who um, has not left their name, um, but is directed towards you, which kind of moves exactly off what you were saying, which is how do you reconcile appealing to a broad audience without diluting your message? Do you even think about a broad audience or do you think about those one or two people who, my gosh, that happened to me or I didn't see anything there. What am I not seeing? I mean, I'm, I'm never trying only to reach one person. When I'm thinking about, as we were talking about, trying to reach anybody at all, like I think so far for me, it's been about having a story that I really want to tell, which all of the things I've done so far have been, and then doing my best to make that the, the best version of that that it can be or the version that I most want to tell. And so, no, I don't think I'm ever thinking about trying to reach a very broad audience. But maybe I have a hope that if I execute what I'm trying to, that that is a possibility. Um. Lisa, this is a question for you. Um, it's from Terry. Give us an example of a movie you love that satisfies Make Your Broken Heart into Art. Moonlight, 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 Moonlight. Um, <laughs> okay, so what did so they it, do in Moonlight that made it work for you? So, you know, I was thinking about Moonlight a couple of times in this panel, which is weird, and then for that question to come up, because when I think somebody said, you know, entertain, the word entertaining, and somehow doesn't, connect for me with a film like Moonlight. I'm not sure that I was actually entertained while watching it. But at the end of it, I was like, I'm, wait, I, wanna s I feel good. What, what just happened? And I want to see that again. And did. And so I guess, OK, I've seen it five times probably now. <laughs> but, um, so I, I guess there are the universal themes, right? Love loving, loss, loneliness, you know, so I was thinking just in the last question about these, you know, how do you get a universal thing? I mean, sometimes I remember a teacher used to just tell me to read the Bible, right? You just, that'll tell you any story and human themes, and as long as you have those, you know, you can sort of change the circumstances or where you are or whatever, but everyone want to love it. And I do think that Moonlight had those, you know, basic needs, your mother, I mean, for God's sake, you know, it's like your basic need and all of this. And then, but managed to show us some things that we hadn't seen, which I was also thinking about when Stefan was talking, right, of um, I'm an introvert. I don't think I have ever seen an introverted black male in any player film ever, right? So... It was still about loving and loss. And the fact that he was homosexual, frankly, was the least interesting thing about it. It was the fact that he was quiet and, you know, I wouldn't even say shy. For me, it, it was just a completely different character. So I, I feel like it was this combination of both things. And then it was beautifully shot. It was visually stunning at times. So that, um, for me, that the visual part of filmmaking and visual art has to have that along with everything else and then it just sort of towers over anything else in its wake. Yeah, I mean, I think that's super important when thinking about art in politics. Um, someone once said to me, well, if you mix art and politics, what you're really making is propaganda. Okay. And to my response was, yeah, but it's got to be really sublime propaganda. <laughs> that is, if the art doesn't move you, then it's bad propaganda. Um, and so the visuals, the story, the character identification, the personal feel of it is actually what makes it good propaganda. Um, so here's, a, here's a, um, a, a question for the whole panel, which is actually one of my original questions, which I kind of put off, um, but it, now it's come back. 
Let's talk about just pragmatics. There's a lot of people in the audience here who are artists. You have this idea. You have the story you want to tell. Then how do you actually get it funded? Um, particularly in, you know, cutbacks to the arts, cutbacks to the humanities. Um, what do you do? We'll just go right down the line. Or, you want to start, Stefan? Uh, Maybe I'm a bad example, but I, I've just done them all myself. So the two plays that I've had done in New York, I just found people who, I mean, I just literally emailed everybody, knocked on doors, found somebody who wanted to do it. And then eventually we brought it to New York. And my wife, who's actually sitting right there, um, uh, co-produced the first one and then produced this one. And then you, that's just a series of like hounding everybody you know and say, give me money. <laughs> and then you just do it. Um, there's probably a, an easier way, but actually, in the end, it happened from the minute I wrote it to the minute it's here, it's less than three years, which is actually pretty fast for a play. Um, so that's one way to do it, uh, whether or not that's the right way, but it, I feel like kind of DIY is sort of the, the sort of the new way. You just got to do it yourself and figure, it, figure out a way. Step on. Start small. Uh, know your limit and don't be afraid don't be ashamed of that if if you only have five hundred dollars to make a film write something for five hundred dollars and that's fine it's there's nothing wrong with that um it's not gonna you, you, you're not gonna make jurassic park off of five hundred dollars it's not happening um it, it probably you know just two people in the room t um, talking but it's all about the writing as well when you start small you know and and most most of you guys in this room are actors um, you have connecting connections to filmmakers. Film schools are around this um, the city, NYU, Columbia, um, New York Film uh, Academy. Don't be afraid to f reach out to them. You know, I always I always tell actors every time when I meet them, I say I want to make you know, but we want to do more work. This, that, and the third. I said that's fine. You write for yourself, and then you know, film school directors, we want work. Two, come to us, um, and we, you know, we, we we work on the budget, and everything. So start small. And that's how you, that's how you do it. In my yeah, opinion, I wish I had something new to offer here. Um, <laughs> I I made I've made films for a little bit more money. Lapse was my attempt to just go and make something and not be precious about it and just go and do it quickly, with three people. Um, and a stills, ca like a camera used for stills um, in New York. And it, it cost like $1,500 to get in the can. Like a thousand of that was probably because I organized the whole thing in three days. <laughs> like with a little bit of more time, I think it actually could have been done for a lot less. You know, but that's still $1,500. And that's where, you know, you can have put yourself out there putting your money into your projects and and you know believing in your in yourself before you start going out to others to ask ask for the same and and more and then a lot more besides hitting up creative capital um, yeah. what, what what uh what advice do you give well i think everyone needs to just learn how to ask for money i think um you know it's sort of sad but i mean we're in the u.s there's you know, it's just a part of what's the fabric of an artist's life is to ask for money. Uh, I think even a novelist who's going and just is getting a publisher, sometimes they don't feel that they have the agency or the right to, to then speak up and ask for what they need or negotiate. And so I've been you know, suggesting a variety of things. Maybe it's just a speech class, maybe, it, and then you start there just to get your voice there. And then it really is um, talking to um, people and going to the ask, you know, it's called. So I've been actually talking to development professionals at um, foundations and museums. These are the people who are raising money for those organizations and thinking about, you know, getting them together in front of artists and teaching them how to ask for money. Because if you're a good development person, you you just can do that. You know that. And it's, you have to know. You have to know how to do it. 
I have to learn how to do that as well. I'm <laughs> terrible, terrible. Um, the one thing I would say to the artists in the room is we actually get much less funding from arts organizations. We have the good fortune to get funded by the NEA, but most of our funding actually comes from social justice organizations. Um, social justice organizations are beginning to recognize the importance of artists in actually bringing them on board and doing the sort of work, speaking the languages that artists can. So there's a whole other host of foundations, organizations that artists can actually go and ask for money. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sorry, if it, I'm glad you said that, because I sort of make the assumption if you're going to go to the Foundation Center, you're looking at all sides, you're looking at the arts, you're looking at the minute detail of the story. I mean, it's, it's partly sexual assault, but it's also women, it's also transportation, it's also, um, you know, it's a variety of things. You have to think about every little part that is involved in your project, and find um, people that fund them, because there's funding for lots of weird stuff. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're almost at time, so I have one question. This was inspired by Lisa's answer. Um, we live in dark times, um, uh, times which I didn't think were coming, but kind of knew that they were, because they were always there. Um, it's easy to get depressed. Um, it's easy to want to hide your head in the sand, or worse, spend all the time consuming CNN's feed. Um, what gives you hope at this moment? Lucy, you want to start? We had one odd bit of hope from you, but um, there may be more funding in red state areas, but what else? I, so at Creative Capital, our staff has been going through anti-oppression training for the last two years. Um, we knew that there were a lot of artists from very diverse racial, ethnic, and gender fluid backgrounds, and we wanted to be able to speak to them. Um, what most people didn't realize is there were a lot of things happening to me and another staff person of color that needed to be addressed. And, um, Recently, you know, another thing happened and every single staff person stood up and said <laughs> it wasn't okay. Uh, that gave me so much hope because that was not the case two years ago. And there was a lot of, you know, push and pull about having to do this training and think about this and being called white and all of this. And it was like, and to have that happen was really amazing. Um, yeah, like some things that have been said here, Moonlight actually <laughs> gives me hope in many respects. Like uh, the fact that that character, well, you know, like led that film that he was introverted, that it was such a quiet film mm -hmm. in many ways and that it, it reached kind of the level of success that it did. Um, and I think that now is the time where people aren't willing to be quiet anymore you know, which we've talked about here. Um, and I feel that of myself as well. I think that's necessary and good and the only way forward now. Um, the morning after when um, President Agent Orange got elected into the office, <laughs> I uh, text my longtime mentor, uh, Spike Lee, and told him like, you know, I, don't, I can't believe what happened. What are we gonna do? And he texts me back, when a tough gets tough, we got to get tougher. We just have to, um, he understood where I was coming from, and we have to be even tougher right now with what's going on. We, there's, there's, I'm glad to have people around me that understands my position and I understand where their position. Um, as long as you have people around you that knows what you're going through, you call them up, have a friend of mine, you know, I always call up and say, do you hear what he did, did this morning? They say, yeah, I hear you. We go, <laughs> so we, we're going to figure this out. And um, so you'll be amazed what you yourself can do during times of um, difficulty, I should say. You, we all are equipped um, to go through tough times and to learn what we need to go through. 
So don't forget that. You are tremendously gifted. Everybody in here is tremendously gifted with something. Um, so that's hope for you, that you are tough to go through what you're going through now. Um, I, I'd say two things to give me hope. One was just hearing all of your stories, the fact that, I mean, you guys are doing what we're talking about. You're taking your broken hearts and turning into art. And so we're just four people. There, hopefully there are millions of us out there doing the same thing. Um, but also um, my daughter, our daughter, she's 11. And um, seeing how sort of, um, I mean, she's growing up in New York City around friends of, of that are also living here in New York City. And uh, I feel like it's a different generation. They have hope. They are more aware of things than I was ever aware of at 11. Um, she knows more about politics at 11 than I knew when I was in college. Um, and the fact that she is still in her room every day drawing comics, trying to make stories. Like, she knows what she wants to do. She's like, I want to be, I want to work for Marvel. Like, she knows what she wants to do. And I'm like, that's amazing. And so these young, little, amazing minds are going to go off and make cool art. Um, that gives me hope to see that. Thank you. And um, I want everybody here to thank the people up on the stage who just did an amazing job. And I also want to thank you for coming out here, doing the work that you do, and going out and making cool art. So thank you.